If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start there, and then we're going to kind of bounce around for a little bit. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we talked about faith and how necessary that was for us, what it was and what it wasn't, what it is and what it is. Uh, so I want to kind of start here, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, I'm just going to read the first verse. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And while I was doing my study on faith, I kind of got caught up a little bit on the assurance of things hoped for, hope. And all too often, I am convinced that we don't really operate in present hope. We operate in future hope. And we tend to operate in this realm where I sure hope this is true. And even I hope that I'm good enough. And yet that hope is not what is being referred to here. Because you see what it says as a definition of faith. It's the assurance of things hoped for. And I was pondering, what is it that we are hoping for? Are we hoping for a get out of hell free card? Is that what this is all about? Fire insurance? Making sure that my eternity is taken care of? Not a bad place to start. I mean, given the two options, heaven and hell, most people would choose heaven over hell. And anyone that says they would choose hell obviously has no clue what hell is going to be like. Okay? Now, just to clarify, when I'm talking about hell here, I'm, I'm talking about the lake of fire, the eternal place where those whose names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life are going. Okay, I'm not talking about Hades. I'm not talking about the place where they reside now. I'm talking about eternity. Um, so I, I started looking at this. What is this hope? The first thing I want to do, I, I want to give us a working definition of what hope is. I, I read a very good definition. I'm not going to share it with you now, um, but it is in the library, which uh, I can show you later. By the way, we are making great grounds on the library. We're hoping to have things moved along pretty quick. Uh, we've already entered over a thousand books in our database. We have several hundred more yet to go. Okay, and then once that's in, <coughs> Uh, we'll have it online so you can look and see what we have. You can come in and check out the books. And, and uh, we're really going to encourage um, using the library. There's going to be a lot of resources in there. But the, the short definition that I want to give you, this I've kind of squished together off of this, this lengthy article. Um, the word hope does not communicate uncertainty. As in, I hope that something might occur. As in, Dennis hopes the Broncos win. <laughs> Rather, it is the glad assurance of something that will take place. So that's kind of like saying, I hope I have a good lunch. Well, I know I'm going to have a good lunch. I know what we're having. Christy already let me in on the secret. I know we're also having a good dinner, because i got to fix it. Um, so, 
first, when, when I'm talking about hope, I want you to settle in your mind. This is not something that might be. This is something that will be. Okay? This is not a if and. It is a for certain. It's a when. Not if it will happen. It is when it will happen. Okay? Um, scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, that three things abide, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And then Paul goes on to say, and the greatest of these is love. Now, at some point down the road, I'll, I'll go into what I think Paul is talking about in that statement. But right now I want to focus that hope is one of the three things that abide. Okay? Because without hope, what are we? We want, yeah, hopeless. <laughs> Works that way. But I mean, if you don't have hope, then why are we here? <laughs> what is this about? What is any of this about? <clears throat> I want to uh, flip with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. I want to kind of come at this at a little bit different angle than maybe you're used to. start in verse 1. Paul writes, therefore, I'll leave it to you to find out what the therefore is there for. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Okay, so let's, let's tear this apart for just a minute. In Brothers Meeting, um, last Thursday, we talked about prevenient grace. And that simply put means that God moved before we could. Alright? That means that God put something in place before we ever thought about doing anything. Okay? And right here, um, in verse 1 it says, Since we have been justified by faith, okay? Justified by faith only comes about because of what? Grace. Grace, which was displayed on the cross. Okay? So, God has put forth grace, then through faith we access, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. See, grace isn't just a before the cross thing. It's an enduring thing. It's only by his grace that we can stand. So grace doesn't just bring us to the mark. It carries us through all the way to the end. <clears throat> and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now I'm going to move forward. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Okay, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, this is not what I signed up for. Let's just drop verse 3. Let's, let's stick with verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Great! Let's stay there. 
But Paul, being Paul, has to make it uncomfortable. <laughs> Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. I don't know about you guys, but to my way of thinking is I wouldn't need the endurance if I didn't have the suffering. I don't like suffering. And if you like suffering, I will pray for you. But suffering is necessary. Okay? It's, ne it's not just necessary, it's vital. But it's not... The focus in this is not suffering. Do you see that? What is the focus on this statement here? Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. Suffering is going to come. Okay? Before the cross and after the cross, there will be suffering. But after the cross, you have hope. You have grace, which allows you to rejoice in the midst of the suffering. See, it's not like a if and. There's no choice in this. In this life, we will suffer. So will the non-believers. There, there's no choice. That's part of this sinful world. Suffering. The suffering produces endurance, verse 4. And endurance produces character... And character produces hope. I know some of you guys, and some of you guys have got a lot of character. Some of you guys are just characters. <laughs> but God is building in us something greater than ourselves. Okay? Honestly, folks... If it were just you, and God were not building His nature in you, you would not be that great a thing. I know I wouldn't. I, without the grace of God in my life, if God was not building in me, by nature, I'm not a very nice person. I can be very cold and uncaring. That's one of those things that God is changing in me. I'm, I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure I like it. It was a lot easier when I saw somebody that was going through a hardship to just eat, turn off the emotion, not let it affect me. I don't like it so much when God touches me and I feel for that person. I don't, I don't like feelings all that much. One of the scariest questions Christy ever asks me is, how do you feel about that? When Christopher was getting married, I could take you right to the place on East Side Highway. We were driving down East Side Highway, and Christy said, "So we haven't really talked a lot about this. And, you know, how do you feel about Christopher getting married?" <laughs> oh, I'm in deep water. <laughs> Uh, I don't really feel anything. This is the natural order. This is, uh, I guess I feel happy because he won't be living under my house forever. <laughs> I feel relieved because everything's done in the proper order. Feel. And it struck me. I, I don't really. Now, if she had asked me, what do you think about Christopher getting married? There wouldn't have been a hiccup at all. I've been able to tell a lot of what about I think. What I feel. <coughs> the character that Christ is building in us, the more we become like Him, the more things change. For example, when Lazarus died, what did Jesus do? He wept. When Jesus came down the Mount of Olives and he was looking over Jerusalem and he wasn't just seeing Jerusalem that was. He was seeing Jerusalem to come. And he was seeing the destruction that was going to be wrought on that
that city, and not just that city, but the people in that city, what did he do? He, he wailed. You know, the, the, the scripture says that he wept. He wept at Lazarus, but that was kind of the quiet, almost like a, a soundless sob. And yet when he looked out over Jerusalem and it says that he wept bitterly, he wailed. That's like that, that unrestrained <clears throat> sobbing. I don't like that. I don't like when God goes, <clears throat> and I hear somebody going through a hardship, and I feel God letting me feel what they're going through. <clears throat> I don't like it. Because that makes me not in control. It makes God in control. And I don't like when all the wet stuff happens. You know, it's, it's bad enough it comes out your eyes, but then it comes out your nose and, and out your mouth if you're not careful. I like things tidy. But he's building in me not my nature, but his nature. So it produces character, and character produces hope. Verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. First, I want you to understand this, folks. The hope that we have should never, ever put you to shame. You should never be ashamed of the hope that you have. Never. You should never be concerned about how the world views this hope that we have. They don't have it. They don't understand it. To them it looks as foolishness. Don't be ashamed of this hope. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is what sets us apart, folks. God's Spirit is inside of us. It is not inside of them. And instead of being arrogant about that, we should be broken. Because the only difference between us and them is your position at the cross. We don't have anything over them. What do we have to brag about except what God gave us? And if he gave it to us, why do we brag as if it's ours? So when we look at the world, it is so easy. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I shared uh, with the prayer group and with the brothers meeting. I was really, really struggling. Um, I had received a video um, of a, a Muslim woman. Um, she was accused of burning the Quran. Here she is in their mosque, and she's accused of burning the Quran. And at first, it was, did you do this? No, 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 I didn't do this. Okay, why would you do this? No, 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 I didn't do this. Why would you do this? No, 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 I didn't do this. The police were called in. They tried to protect her. This, this crowd gathered around her, and I, I'm not talking like 20 or 30 people. I'm talking like thousands of people. That the streets filled up. The police, looking around, they tried to get this woman out of there by lifting her up on the roof and dragging her to safety. And they caught her and pulled her down. And I have never seen such animalistic behavior. They, they were not satisfied with beating her. They, they not only beat her, but they laid her on the ground and drove a car over her. And after the car had drug her for about 100 yards, they weren't content with that. And we're looking at men and boys. I'm looking at boys in there that are 9, 10 years old, chucking rocks at this woman. They threw her into a dry riverbed, and they tried to light her on fire but her clothes were so wet from the blood, it wouldn't light. So they would take off their scarves and wrap them around her and light the scarves on fire.
Now, I've seen a lot of the horrific things that the radical Muslims do. And yet nothing had affected me the way that this did. I despised them. I did not want them saved. I wanted God to push a button and drop a nuke right on all of those people. And I had no love in my heart. I had no pity. I had no mercy. I had no grace. And I knew that's not where God wanted me. And I cried out to him. I said, God, you've got to change me because I want nothing. I don't want those people in heaven. They don't deserve it. And that little voice whispered, and you do. God, I never did anything like that physically. How many people have you murdered in your mind? And I struggled with this whole concept that, oh, my sin is not as bad as their sin. And I carefully graded on the curve to benefit myself. And yet the very words I read to you were penned by a man who behaved as one of them. Who took a man and had him stoned because he chose to believe in Christ. And I look at Paul and go, wow, what a story of hope and redemption. But I didn't want it for them. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I, God does incredible things with me sometimes. I listen to the voice of the martyrs radio. And within a week of this thing coming up, and I was struggling, I, I tell you, I was struggling. Because I knew what God wanted of me, but I couldn't bring myself to that place. And on the Voice of the Martyrs, they were covering their 2015, and they were kind of doing the highlights of the stories. And I was reminded again how God is moving in the Muslim world. Oftentimes, because of things like this, people who look at the Quran and they look at it, and this has been their life, and then they look at the behavior that is exhibited on the street are going, this is insufficient. There's got to be more. And I'm listening to these stories how God is appearing to people, the, the image of Christ is appearing to people in the Muslim world in visions and dreams. And I'm not talking just, you know, your mediocre caliber Muslim. I'm talking radicals. Those that belong to ISIS who have pulled the trigger to execute Christians. And God is appearing to them and telling them, you are persecuting my church. And he is offering to them life. A life for eternity that they have never had a possibility of before. They're not reading this. They're not picking this up and looking at it. God is reaching down with the power that is his alone and touching lives that are not just neutral toward him, but openly hostile to him. And I'm reminded as I'm listening to this thing of how very much God loves Muslims, those animals. <coughs> And it humbled me because I realized, and I knew this in my head, but it was sinking into my heart that I was no better than them. I had no right to expect that God would save me. I was in no position any better than them to deserve salvation.
If those people have no chance at hope, what chance have we? Because what separates us from them, yeah, we've received the cross, but a lot of times it's our own self-righteousness that puts us in measure with them. And my righteousness is what? Is filthy rags. My righteousness is worthless. And, and I want to somehow put us on the scales and, and make them come up wanting and, and myself not. And I become what they are by despising them. Do, do you see the trap there? And as God started revealing this, he started softening my heart and that stupid leaky thing started happening. Because see, God isn't looking at people groups. He's looking at individuals. He's looking at the person. <coughs> and when I say that Jesus paid for all sin for all time, I want to try and exclude some of those sins because I find it abhorrent. It offends me that he would die for those sins. But, but what does scripture tell us? All sin was taken care of. All of it. There was nothing lacking. There was nothing that was carefully set aside to not be covered. So, I had to back up. This is kind of why we're going through this process here. Going back to the basics. I had to back up and I had to look at... What am I about? What are we about? What is this all about? Is this a you know weekly get together for motivational speaking? There are a lot better motivational speakers out there than me. Is this just um, <coughs> coffee time with discussion? There's probably better coffee places. Summarizing these verses that we just read, the, the blessed hope that we have is the joyful assurance that God will extend his benefits to us and that Jesus Christ will return. Jesus said he would return. The angels said he would return. The epistles Say that he will return. It's not if, it's when. So, how does this affect us right now? Okay, Because we know he's coming back. And honestly, if you don't know that he's coming back, get on your face before him. And don't get up until he has given you that assurance. Because it's going to cost you some things. It's going to cost you maybe some pride. Because you find out you really don't have it all figured out. Because there's a lot of things that I look at in scripture and I go, I don't know. I don't know. You know, and I, I took the eschatology class, and I've been through different teachings. I had my graph and my chart all lined out, and I knew how it was going to happen. And God laughed. He's like, oh, Glenn, you're so cute. You ain't got a brain in your head, but you're so cute. I don't need to know when. I just need to know it will. So where does this leave us? How does this affect us? Turn to 1 John chapter 3, if you would. Let's 
start in verse 1. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. John says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. <coughs> Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. You know, there's a, a, a thought that's running through here that I want to try and kind of tie this together with. God loves us. Always comes back to that. God loves us. It's not based on our worth. It's not based on our merit. It's not based on what we've done or what we can do. Or what we won't do. It's based on His nature. He loves us. Okay? We almost make that a paradox because at one and the same time, God is love. And yet He is also just. And, and we have a hard time bringing those two things together. The way it was brought together is Jesus Christ. Because God is still absolutely just. But the price has been paid. So when we confess our sins, He is just to forgive us our sins. Okay? It's not a paradox with God. He is made a way. So it starts with love. We are called the children of God, and so we are. That statement right there should make you feel incredibly special. God has adopted you into his family and made you his very own. You are his son. You are his daughter. There are no grandchildren. Just sons and daughters. And if you are a child of God, you are an inheritor of everything that is His. You are a co-heir with Jesus Christ. Okay? So, it starts with His love. We are His children. The world doesn't know us because it doesn't know Him. If they knew Him, they would know us. This is how we know each other. What does Jesus say how the world will know that we're His disciples? If we do what? We love each other. Okay? <coughs> Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. See, there's something better coming. And I don't just mean streets of gold and pearly gates. I mean personally for me and personally, individually for you, there is something better coming. What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, who's the he there? <laughs> Jesus. We know that when Jesus appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. Paul writes in Thessalonians that the perishable will put on the imperishable. We will be changed in an instant. We will go from what we are now to what we will be in eternity. We shall be like him. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, this is what I want to leave you with right here. In 
in recent years, holiness has taken a severe beating in the church. We have diminished grace to being something cheap and really unworthy of a just God. While I am absolutely convinced all sin has been paid for, Paul tells us that this should not encourage us to sin. It should rather encourage us to live holy lives. Because we are now set apart. We should look and live markedly different than what we were. Than what the world is. This all comes down to idols. You're going, what, 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 where, the, where did you just go? Listen to me. God will not share you with anything. And if you won't let things go, God will let you be turned over to them. Do you understand what that means? That if there are things in your life that are taking the place of God and you're not listening to that prompting where he tells you, put this down, he will give you over to it. And he'll say, okay, you, you, you really think this is your answer? There you go. Not because he despises us, not because his love for us is diminished, but because he wants us to experience what that false God, that idol, will bring to us, which is nothing but misery. He longs for us to live holy lives because that's the best thing for us, not for him. God is not diminished when you fall. God is completely self-contained. He doesn't need us to live holy lives. He designed us to live holy lives because that's the way it works best. And if you have anything in your life that is insinuating itself between you and God, the God and, then I want to encourage you this morning, lay it down. I know that sounds so easy. Now look, I'm going to share with you guys. From the time I was five years old, I was exposed to pornography. Okay? I remember being five years old, going to my neighbor's house. They had stacks of Playboys and Penthouse in the garage. And all the guys in the neighborhood would come. As soon as Red would go off to work, all the guys in the neighborhood would come and they'd sit in the garage and they'd look at all these. And I, what, what is this? That's weird, you know? But I, I was exposed to that, and I grew up, and I, I struggled for years and years and years and years, and I still have got to be very, very cautious what I allow in my home, what I allow in my eyes, okay? But I had to come to the place where God was more to me than pornography was. And even when I came to that place, I had to keep throwing myself at his feet, begging him to deliver me. Because it's very easy to go, okay, God, I know I'm not supposed to do this, so you take care of it for me. Well, obviously, you didn't do your job. Right? We all have areas that we stumble in. We all have areas of unique weakness to ourselves. Okay? Yours may not be pornography. I, I don't know what a lot of yours is. The only way out is by falling on your face before him each and every time. Not after it happens. Before it happens. I set up accountability. First I'm accountable to my wife. Then I'm accountable to my brother. Then I'm accountable to several of my sons. This morning, one of my accountability partners sent out a note. Please pray for me. Please pray. That's all that needs to be said. 
God, you know where he's at. Deliver him. Don't let the enemy get victory here. Father, intercede on his behalf. Protect him with the shield of your favor. Cover him. Let him run to you and hide himself in you. <coughs> Don't face the danger alone. Put things in place to safeguard yourself. Now, folks, don't fool yourself. If you want to do it, you're going to do it. No matter what you put in the way, you will do it. Okay? You find a way to sin. Okay? You've got to desire God more than anything. And this is where we go back to what I talked about last week. Seeking God with all your heart. When you seek Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your mind, He will be found. When you call out to Him, He will save, He will deliver. And He doesn't just say the one time. He doesn't limit it. Each and every time. Each and every time. God, help me please. God, deliver me. God, rescue me. I'm in a place where I can do nothing. I'm at a loss. I'm weak. I'm frail. Today, Father, I don't have it in me. I need you to save me. <clears throat> and don't let pride get in there. Pride feeds all of your sin. I don't want people to think less of me. So, so you'd rather be less of a person by engaging in your sin than admitting that you struggle with it? Listen, the hope that we have is that what he has said he has done is done, and what he has said he will do, he will do. God is not like us. He is not like man that he should lie. When he tells us something is so, it is so. Okay? So I want to encourage you today. Those things that have wormed their way in your life, and it, it may have been there for a long, 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 long time. Long time. You can bow to them, or you can bow to God, but you can't bring them with you. God, God rejects those things. Okay? You've got to lay them down. Beg Him to help you. Set something up where you have brothers or sisters praying for you that can walk with you through it. Look at this. This American ideal of the rugged individual, it's garbage. Okay? God has called us to be dependent. First on Him, then on each other. That's why the body was put in place. Okay? So that we could help one another. When I'm weak, you guys can be strong. When you're weak, maybe I can be strong. We help each other. We don't look down our noses at each other because we know we all came from the same muck, the same pit, the same yucky place. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you this morning. And I thank you, God, that you are the great deliverer. Even, Father, as years and years ago, you took Israel out of Egypt and you delivered them in an incredibly powerful and dynamic way. <clears throat> Miraculous. Even now you desire to do that with each of us. To set us free from those things that would entangle us. Those things that would hinder us. Those things that would cause us to stumble. Those things that would hold us in place. God, I ask that you would put a hunger and a thirst in us for you. A desire, a longing, a zeal to know you more and more. To become more and more like you. To allow you to work in us. To allow your spirit to make those changes necessary. That we would be a mirror of you to the world. Father, I ask that you would help us to tear down those idols. 
God, that we would break those chains, that your spirit would set us free to no longer be burdened again by these things. Lord God, I ask that you would help us to walk alongside our brothers and sisters to strengthen them, to encourage them on this journey. Father, and I ask that you would reveal pride wherever it will exist. <clears throat> Father, your word promises us that you will resist the proud, but the humble you will lift up. Give us true understanding, Father, of who you are and who we are. Help us, Father, to know more intimately all that you have done on our behalf and all that you yet desire to do. We thank you, Father, for your grace. That where our sin abounds, your grace does much more abound. But we don't use that as an opportunity to sin. But, Father, to, to bathe and soak in your grace. To receive mercy when there was no expectation of receiving mercy. Father, that we can become more and more like Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to walk in holiness, that we would be holy as you are holy. That you would make of us a people that are true representations of you. That, Father, the world would see us as being different. That other brothers and sisters would know us at a glance. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.